uh, my little history, and then I'm going to spend most of the time on air traffic control, and I hope that you're going to find it interesting and find out some things. Okay, I was born in Edmonton. I did my grade school in Edmonton. Uh, my family saw the light and moved to Vancouver. Uh, I did school uh, at Lord Bing. I was at the University of British Columbia. At 16, I got my pilot's license. And uh, I got commercial license, multi-engine rating, float endorsements, and a first-class instrument rating at about 1,000 hours. Okay. My work history, uh, during uh, university, I worked on the dining cars for the CNR, traveling from Vancouver to Winnipeg and return. I did survey crew on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, I worked at Oliver E. Underwood designing and selling accounting systems for mechanical accounting machines. Uh, Frieden selling electronic uh, accounting machines. Uh, I worked for Niagara Plants just a short time waiting to go into air traffic control and uh, federal government and NAV Canada as an air traffic controller. Okay, now, uh, the control tower primarily handles VFR traffic, and VFR stands for visual flight rules, but IFR uh, airplanes are involved, and that's the instrument flight rules. Uh, and this is the training that I went through. Uh, training for a tower license, I spent two weeks of an intensive course in uh, Vancouver at the ATC school. I had four months observing uh, and supervised a bit of work at Abbotsford Tower. I did four months intensive courses and simulation in Ottawa and eight months of supervised training at Abbotsford Tower to get my VFR license. Uh, I was at Abbotsford for a year and a half and had the pleasure of working two Abbotsford air shows, which was the gas. And I spent a year and a half in Prince George, and I'm sorry, Herb, that that was not a gas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, air traffic control, uh, IFR. Uh, I uh, went to the training school in the Vancouver ACC, and that's called an Area Control Center. And just to cover things a bit here, there are three areas of air traffic control. There is the control tower, which everybody sees at the airport, <coughs> sitting over top of uh, the airports uh, that are busy. Uh, there is a terminal unit, and then the Area Control Center handles all the other traffic across the country. So I spent three months intensive classroom simulation, a year of supervised training as an en route controller to get my IFR license. I spent six months of uh, supervision training and became a terminal controller. And the ACC and the terminal are in the same building in Vancouver. I did 26 years in the Vancouver Center. I did 10 years on a route, I did one year at terminal, and then I had 15 years where I was cross-trained into the computer systems, and I spent 15 months on courses, the AT school in Cornwall, to get certified, uh, certification as a data systems controller. Uh, this picture here out to the side is a typical en route uh, uh, position in the center, the radar scope there, and there's these little strips there. Uh, these are used on a data board, and these are the data boards on the side here. And information, all the flights are on it, on that. And we use that to refer to. Okay, types of VFR flight, visual flight rules. Pilots are responsible for their own uh, separation, remain clear of cloud and ground con and have ground contact. Minimum of 1,000 feet below cloud and three miles of visibility. The highest altitude uh, they're allowed to, uh, on airways is to 9,500 feet, except in mont mountain terrain, and then it's raised up to 12,500. Small airports with uh, little or no radio contract uh, control, and uh, the only one I can think of is a 108 mile house. It's just a bare strip there. 
airports with flight service stations. Now, these are radio uh, flight service stations, and in the early days of air traffic control, and there was no radar, as airplanes overflew these positions, they report the positions to the flight service stations, and the flight service stations then would relay down into the air traffic control. Uh, airports, uh, yeah, and the uh, flight service, the, the stations, is uncontrolled airspace with voice advisory. Uh, airspace usually to 2,000 feet in a five mile radius. And uh, the, uh, yeah, these uh, flight service stations, uh, they, there is no control with them. Now the air, uh, IFR um, aircraft are the airports with towers and the airspace there is positive in that you have to have a radio to be able to fly within their control zones because there has to be communication. Uh, the, uh, and the tower then, they are responsible for the airport itself and they sequence the IFR and VFR flights and be able to set up separation so they can get traffic out and they get traffic in. Instrument flight rules, ATC provides separation between all flights under IFR control according to the type of airspace. Uh, navigational aids uh, available and radar coverage make a difference as to what the separation standards are. The aircraft is under ATC control from the time it pushes back from the gate until it arrives at the gate at destination. The control tower controls all movement on the ground and the air from surface to 2,000 feet out to 10 miles. All traffic positively controlled must have radar or must have radio. Terminal control is located over the top of large airports and control traffic within its airspace supplying aircraft separation between IFR aircraft and advisory to VFR aircraft within the terminal airspace. Uh, terminal airspace covers from the ground up to 23,000 feet and it usually has a 25 to 30 mile radius of the airport. Terminal sets up the flow into and out of the airport. The Area Control Center uh, controls all the airspace above the terminal and tower for, uh, from the ground to 65,000 feet in the flight information region, and I'll explain that in a moment, supplying separation between IFR aircraft and advisory information to VFR aircraft. This is a typical picture of a uh, uh, cockpit. Okay, these are the flight information regions. I don't know how it's showing up there on your screen, but each one of these uh, information regions has an air traffic control center. Uh, that's the en route radar, and some of them will have a terminal control unit. This section right in here is the Vancouver FIR. This big piece of airspace is Edmonton's FIR. Then there is uh, Winnipeg, and it goes up into uh, Hudson Bay. Then uh, the Toronto airspace is down in here. Quebec airspace is up through here. This little piece in here and down into here is Gander Domestic. And this section out here is Gander Oceanic. And Gander takes all the airplanes that are flying over the Atlantic and feeds them up over top of this and uh, before, well we don't have any radar out there so the separation standards were very high but we've got a new system that's called ADS-B and is using satellite systems and the separation standards have been greatly decreased and we're moving a lot more traffic over. This is the uh, flight information region for Vancouver. You can see there, this is the Queen Charlotte Islands in here. This is the Alaska Panhandle. And we come out 
over top of the ocean here, then the U.S. border, and we separate between Edmonton just east of Cranbrook. We come up here through Fort St. John and across top here. So that's the airspace that uh, Vancouver controls. This now, uh, the route navigations, uh, VFR again uh, reference to the ground using geographic uh, charts. Every aircraft has a pump uh, compass. Using navigation beacons, a non-directional beacon is a beacon that just sends out a signal and within the aircraft there is a gauge and it points at that particular beacon. So it doesn't give you any tracks on it. Then you have distance measuring equipment, and that will give you the distance from the nav aid, which is a very helpful thing. Uh, VOFR, that's very uh, VH uh, omni range, and it at very high frequency, and it uses a radio, and it puts out 360 tracks, so that we're uh, we can ask an airplane to give us a position on that and he can give the radio and the distance. Uh, uh, then the, there's what's called the TAC end, which is ultra high frequency, and it has the tracks and DME, and it's military. Now a track guidance localizer, an example of this is uh, at Vancouver <coughs> to the north, we have that high terrain in the mountains. So until we got a track guidance look, we had to run everything south of Vancouver where it got very congested. By putting in a track guidance locator, it's very... Now, uh, what we work with is called highways in the sky. And uh, these are just sort of showing nav aids where they are and then we connect them with airways. And these are the airways in the Vancouver FIR. So you can see there's a lot of them. Now there's air space restrictions in all this. Uh, when airplanes are flying, when they're going eastbound, they fly at odd thousand feet, 3,000, 5,000, so on. And the westbound track from 180 to 359, they fly the even rights. A VFR airplane flying will fly, fly 500 feet below whatever the direction he was going according to the numbers. All altitudes above VFR maximum on airways are under uh, positive control of the appropriate ATC. Altitude is determined in the aircraft by an altimeter, which is basically a barometer. Uh, in low-level airspace, uh, because of weather systems, you've got high pressure, low pressure, constantly having to correct the uh, altimeter by giving altimeter readings. And then high-level airspace is above 18,000 feet and we work on a standard pressure, which is 2992 uh, inches of mercury. <coughs> okay, the way ATC works is that ATC works together, handing off control of the aircraft from one unit to the next, tower to terminal, terminal to the ACC. The ACC works with surrounding ATC units, such to the east, it's Edmonton, uh, to the north is Anchorage, to the west is Oakland. Oakland joint, uh, controls most of the, of the Pacific. And to the <laughs> west is Seattle, or, uh, and to the east is Seattle and Salt Lake City. The ACC also works very close with the military and with NORAD. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on the Vancouver airspace because it, it is kind of unique and I think you'll get a better idea of, of how it's controlled. And Vancouver has uh, the unique uh, control that uh, we control Bellingham because the American uh, 
radar does not cover down to the area of Bellingham. So Vancouver is the only air traffic control unit that controls a piece of American airspace. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a, just a little slide of approach to the runway. Of course, a BFR airplane is going to make a visual approach and he's under control of the tower and uh, the tower will sequence his eye as VFR airplanes within the eye of our airplanes. Uh, there are three basic re uh, approaches. There's an NDP approach, which again uh, is a, a beacon that does not have a track off it. Then you have the instrument flight rules ILS and DME approach. And an ILS is like a track guidance <coughs> localizer and that it gives a very precise track and all of these will have certain limits when they make their approach. And the, the best one is a, a localizer a glide path DME. The glide path now gives you a line to come down to the lowest level before you have to do an overshoot. <coughs> the approach into Kelowna, and this uh, was before we had an ILS system here. It was just an NDB, and the flights would come up to here, to the beacon, and it would go out for two minutes, then he'd go out for one minute, do a turn like this, and then come straight in. And the limits that he would have on that was almost 1,500 feet above ground. So you can see that uh, the limits were very low and in fact uh, <coughs> very high. Uh, as you can see, it was even higher than what BFR was. So, and then the miss, if he has a miss approach, then he comes back here. And uh, also the approaches at Kelowna and Penticton interfered with each other, so we had to be careful with that. Okay, on the uh, a localizer, uh, the glide path and DME measuring equipment, you can see we now get down to 651 feet. And uh, with the chart here, we, can, we have radar coverage in this area now, and we can vect, vector the airplane directly on the final approach. So there's no procedural control and that sort of thing. So we can blow the traffic much, much better in there. Uh, this is the operation at, uh, at Kelowna. There's an air controller that controls the uh, active runway and the airspace. We have a clearance delivery. He <coughs> delivers the IFR clearances, in other words, uh, telling the airplane what route he is to fly and what altitude he can go for. And uh, we have, uh, uh, oh, I missed the ground controller there. He controls all the movement on the airplane other than the active runway. And then there's an over, uh, a supervisor overseeing the operation and there's a tower chief that does the administration. And this is kind of a, a typical setup for a tower operation. <coughs> Vancouver Tower. Now, it's unique in that uh, there are runways, active runways to the north and to the south. So in es essence, we have two towers within the one building. One takes care of the traffic to the north. The other takes uh, care of the traffic to the south. They each have a, a, an air controller, a ground controller, a clearance delivery, a ramp controller. Uh, we didn't used to control the ramps, but we do now. Uh, an air traffic assistant controller, and what that is, is a, it's like a clerical job where he gets the flight plans and creates the strips that we use and he delivers that. He gives us uh, altimeter settings and he also gives us uh, information on uh, different towers and that sort of thing. Uh, between the two towers, we need to have, be able to coordinate back and forth. <coughs> 
So, and also we have an overflight controller because there are flights that are coming out of Vancouver Harbor going to Victoria and they fly right over uh, Vancouver. So, and we have the approach controller and there's a coordinator that works between the two towers there so that there is a communication going back and forth. The terminal operation, again, uh, in Vancouver, this is split like the towers are. There's two different uh, terminal units on it. Uh, we ha uh, have an inner departure controller. He's the one that takes the airplanes as they come off the ground, and he starts pointing them in the right direction. And then the outer departure controller, he gets them set up on the vinyl to then be passed on the area control center. And uh, each one of them have a data controller that takes care of these strips and uh, writes down all the information that is needed for it. Uh, there's also a VFR controller because there's a huge amount of traffic that is VFR that travels from Vancouver Island into Vancouver. And you have to have control of these airplanes. And Victoria is also controlled from the terminal unit. This is a, a typical screen of what it would look like with uh, traffic here. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the speed, and this is the altitude, and there is the ident on the airplane. Okay, this is the Air Traffic Control Center, and this is a typical setup of the data boards, the radar positions, uh, information that's got, uh, like altimeters, approach charts, all this information is displayed on these screens. So the Vancouver Terminal and ACC are in the same building. The ACC is set, set up in four complexes. There's East High, Airports Low, West High, and Terminal. Each complex is divided into sectors, this being a sector. Each sector has an air controller, a data controller. Each complex has a supervisor. Data systems uh, oversee the sector setups, databases, and the control, uh, the computer systems. There's a shift manager that oversees the whole operation. There's over 100 controllers that are working in the air traffic control center, and there is also air traffic control assistance uh, for the admin. So th this is a picture of a, a typical air traffic control center. It's not Vancouver, but it, you know, Vancouver is very similar to that. The operation manager sees the ov uh, overall ATC operations. This is admin position. Data system manager sees, oversees all the uh, computer navigation requirements. The re regional school manager oversees training. Then our technicians uh, for repairs and that sort of thing. And there is a chief that oversees the whole operation. I think I pretty well ca caused uh, or discussed these areas here. Uh, so I'll just move on. This gives you an idea, if you're not following any navigational aids and uh, no airways, no radar, it's 20 minutes between uh, to the front behind it and a jet flies at 8 miles a minute, so that's 160 miles off each. This is what the separation standards were in the Gander Ocean. And 45 <coughs> miles lateral, you couldn't have anyone with a 45 nautical to your left or 45 nautical to your right, so that's 90 miles. Flying on airways, we can get this reduced to 10 minutes. And uh, the lateral is the distance on the airway. And the airway is uh, 9 nautical miles. And as uh, the beam comes out, it gets wider and then comes in slower. Okay. All right, uh, under radar, five nautical miles, uh, and in short uh, range, three nautical miles. Uh, 
so there's the highlights of my career here. And I will cut it off there. And if there are any questions, you can uh, contact me later, or I don't know whether we have time for any questions. Probably not. Can you go back to the, the highlights of your career? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and this reason? Can you tell us about the luggage? Now it's, it's time for our uh, 